Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Hello, and welcome back to Fighting on Film. And this week, we are looking at The Wind and the Lion. Now, you could argue that this isn't a war film and it's more of an adventure film. But there's enough military elements in this and some really interesting colonial and historical context behind it that I think yeah. it definitely fits with the podcast. It, it's like a gunboat diplomacy film that goes hot. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, and that's a neat, we're already a niche show, but we're getting mega niche this week. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, we, we could we could do it. We could do a month of those, you know, sand panels. <laughs> the poor listeners. We've already put them through Dirty Dozen December. <laughs> we've already put them through Merc Month and Anzac Month. I think there's at least... We can only go through niche for these months, Matt. Just wait for Train Month. <laughs> train Month is going to be fun when we get it will, to it. It will. Okay, let's let's get into The Wind in the Line. So, Rob, um, do you want to do cast and then I'll do production? Sure thing, why not? Yeah. So, cast this week. Um, so we have the legendary late Sean Connery as Muli Ahmed El Razuli, and he is the main villain of the film. But is he the villain of the film? It's a difficult one, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so he's known for playing obviously the first incarnation of Bond in the 60s, in uh, up until 1971, then again in 83. He's no stranger to war films. If you listen to the show before, we've talked about him in The Hill, we've talked about him in Bridge Too Far, he's also in The Longest Day. Um, and the 70s for me are perhaps one of the most interesting parts of his career because it's post-Bond and it's a kind of a golden period where you can just do what you want as an actor once you've done Bond. You can have the pick of the roles. I think it's like, for me, the most interesting things Daniel Craig's doing aren't Bond films. Um, that's another discussion. But he was in the Anderson tapes in the 70s. He was in The Offence alongside Ian Bannon. They're both Sidney Lumet films which I think is a lot of it is interesting for Connery. There's a lot of Lume movies. And obviously, in the same year, 1975, as Wind and Lion, he does The King and I, which is another Rudyard Kipling-inspired adventure <laughs> film. The man who would be king, not the king and the I. The man who would be king, sorry. I, I almost, <laughs> I'm leaving that in. I would love I'm, to see <laughs> Sean Connery too. <laughs> I always do that. I always get the two, just because it's got king in the title. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. But no, the, the man who would be king, obviously, with Michael Caine. And then Zardos, which is just a cult yeah. classic. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this is two years before um, Bridge Too Far. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it's a year after Zardos. Just to put this in maximum context. Connery context. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because what a, what a decade. Yeah. I, really I, weird really decade. Really. Yeah, it's mm. interesting. And then obviously he'd go on to win his Academy Award for the Untouchables in 1987. You know, not with us now, one of the greats. Um, mm. Then we have Candice Bergen as Eden uh, Pedicaris, and she's a five-time Emmy Award winner. Started her career in the mid-60s with another role in a Sidney Lumet film uh, of called The Group. Uh, she also appeared in The Sand Pebbles in the same year. And in the 70s, she starred as the, in the lead in the 70s revisionist Western Soldier Blue. She was also in Gandhi in 1982. And then in 1988, she was cast in the long-running American sitcom Murphy Brown that I'd never heard of. No, um, never heard of that either. But it was big. It ran for 10 years. Oh, okay. um, made her a household name. And then more recently, I think it was from 2005 to 2008, she starred in Boston Legal. And she's also been in like loads of American TV stuff. I think she voiced her character of Murphy Brown in Family Guy. And there was loads of crossover episodes. I think she was in Seinfeld as Murphy Brown as well. It must have been quite popular at the time. Wow. Okay. One of those things that doesn't get outside that's, the that's UK. That's I do like US. about US TV, where they, they really do love a crossover. Oh, yeah. And it can, and also their TV can be so contained as yeah. well. You, you think it would be, you know, well known. Anyway, but she's fantastic in this um, as Eden Picaris. I love the character. I'll talk about that more later. Uh, then we've got Brian Keith as Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he's absolutely knocking out the park. <laughs> it's like... 
a spit of him. The um, best he's Roosevelt you'll ever see, without a doubt. Even the down to the like the cheesy grin that he gives, it's it's fantastic. Um, he's perhaps uh, best known for his role in the 1961 Disney film The Parent Trap, um, but he was also well known in like westerns in the 50s. Um, he was in Western TV serials like uh, Wagon Train and How the West Was Run. Uh, one uh, Later in his career, in the 80s, um, he was in Young Guns and he was in another John Milius film that I know Matt loves in 1997, Rough Riders, as President McKinley. Which is, which is really ironic, considering he played Roosevelt already. Yeah. And then I think it's Tom Berger that plays Roosevelt in Rough Riders. Yeah, and it's, that, that's so interesting. I'd never well, actually put that together. I think it was a scene. I didn't like, realize that was him. Yeah, no, Milius has like favorites. I think because mm. we'll another guy like was was in a Milius film here, um, but he's also in a an eighties American uh, show called World War Three, and he plays the Russian um, premier in it, which is like oh, okay. a a Russian uh, American series about if the Cold War had gone hot. Um, and then we've got the legendary John Huston. Um, as the Secretary of State John Hay. Uh, he's a two-time Oscar winner. Started his career in the 30s. Uh, his, uh, for the Maltese Falcon in 1941 was his first, uh, one of his first directing roles. And then during the war, he worked for the Army Signal Corps, directed three films, uh, Report from the Aleutians, The Battle of San Pietro, and Let There Be Light. They're really important movies from the Second World War. Um, and Let There Be Light was so controversial at the time that it didn't get aired till the 80s. Um, he his post war credits include African Queen, Red Bag of Red Bag of Courage, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Red Bag, but the Red Badge of Courage, and Heaven Knows, uh, Mister Allison, and obviously the man who would be king in the same year as mm-hmm. this film. Um, he's also an actor. Um, his credits include being M in his version of Casino Royale in 1967, uh, and he. Yeah, and he voiced Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings animated movies in the 70s. And he was in one war film, which was an Italian Euro war film called The Greatest Battle in 1978. Oh, I, I, he's really likable in this. Um, he, he's one of those people I just, whatever he's in, I love him. Just love John Huston and John Ford yeah. and, and all those all those guys who made films for the Army Signal Corps. They're all really interesting in their own right. Mm-hmm. You know, Frank Capra. As I said, John Ford, John Houston, and they, it it molds them as as people. And I, I think John John Houston is really interesting as a as a person and a and a, a director. Um, you know, not only for winning the Oscars himself, but coaching your kids and, and directing your kids to win Oscars themselves. Incredible. Yeah, yeah you know, that's probably true. That that's a form of nepotism we've not seen in film since. I don't think. <laughs> You know, but in a good way because I don't think John yeah, yeah. was like that. But it's just interesting to mention. Anyway, moving on, we have Stephen Canelli as USMC Captain Jerome. Uh, he's best known for his role as Ray Krebs in Dallas, but as a Vietnam War veteran um, from the First Air Cavalry, uh, he helped John Milius by providing his wartime experience for the scenes featuring Robert Duvall in Apocalypse Now, which is really oh, interesting. Wow, cool. mm. So we knew him from that. Uh, then we have Vladek. Shebal as the Bashir of Tangier or Tajir. Uh, he's a Polish actor known for his role in, as the grand chess master in Russia with Love. He was a friend of Sean Connery's. Um, his war work, uh, war film work, sorry, starts in 1957 with the Polish war film Canal. He was in Mosquito Squadron and he played General Bla- Bratchenko in 1984's Red Dawn, which is also by Milius. The cast is quite big today. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through them quite quickly. So we then have Roy Jensen as Admiral Chadwick, um, Nadim uh, Sawala as the Sheriff of Wazan, David Fetty plays voice, uh, Vice Consul Richard Drayton, Mark Zuber, Sultan Abiziz, Anton St. John as Van Rockel, he's the German, uh, the German bad guy in this. Uh, we've got Deborah Baxter as Alice Roosevelt, Jack Cooley as Quentin Roosevelt, Chris Aller as Kermit Roosevelt, and uh, Shirley Rothman as Edith Roosevelt. And John Milius has a blink and you'll miss it cameo as a one-armed military advisor. Speaking cameo, nonetheless. Speaking cameo, yeah. Very funny. Once you know it's John Milius, it's very obvious, but watching it for the first time, I was like, who's that dude? He looks really out of place. Oh, no, it's I, love that. I love that scene, actually. It's so good. It's so Talk good. About that later, hopefully. It is. It's just, it's very well cast, and it's very top-heavy casting, I must admit, um, for this. But everyone is bringing their A game. I would agree with that, I think. I mm. think 
Connery being cast as a Berber prince is probably the most audacious thing you can imagine. Um, yes. Yet he somehow carries it off with a mix of like charm and suave. It really works. And a little bit of pathos. And it just, yeah, it just does it. Yeah. He, he brings a real, like, ra- well roundedness to the character, mm. which he may have lost if he'd had a different actor. And I'm not saying yeah. someone couldn't have pulled it off like that, but I just think it's not what you're expecting Connery to do. And obviously, wait, well, just done Zardos, so anything is like possible. Yeah. But this is like, oh, okay, this cut, it, uh, it works. You know, you're halfway through, mm. like, hmm. I can get behind this Rizzoli chap and his, you know, his thing. He wants Disney. He has yeah. some surprising character traits, and mm, mm. it's it's not a caricature character. No, it's not. And the way he, the way his character is written to question the West and how they do things and say, look, they're no better than me. They just got better technology. It's very interesting. I really like that because the script is very sharp. It's very. Cool. Um, Anyway, should we we should dive into production now, shouldn't we? Absolutely. So obviously we've already mentioned that it was written and directed by John Millius. Um and if you're unfamiliar with John Millius's work, um his Google um his Wikipedia page is well worth a uh, a little bit of a read because screenwriter on Apocalypse Now and nineteen forty one, uh writer and director of Red Dawn, uh nineteen eighty nine's Farewell to the King, co wrote um Geronimo, an American legend, which we mentioned in a show and tell episode we a did. while back. Um, he wrote the what I think is the second best um, uh, Jack Ryan movie, Clear and Present Danger. Mm-hmm. We've got Defoe and some Erdl. Oh yeah, cool. that's um, cool. I I like to think that some somewhere in that script, John Millius wrote, "Put Defoe in Erdl." Um, <laughs> Big letters <laughs> underlined, like. Um. And then he he was uncredited for a number of script revisions on The Hunt for Red October, Saving Private Ryan, and Behind Enemy Lines. So the man can write a war movie. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, moving on from John, though, um, the cinematography, which I think is a really important part of this film, was provided by Billy Williams, who mm. uh, he worked on The Billion Dollar Brain, which was a sequel to The Ipcrest File in 1967. Uh, he uh, worked on The Voyage of the Damned in 1976, won an Oscar for his uh, cinematography for Gandhi in 82. Um, and I think perhaps, you know, his most important element of this film is that he is the absolute lad at the very beginning of the film who pulls out a Webley bulldog oh. and shoots down half a dozen oh. Berber tribesmen as they attack um, the Pedicaris villa. And it's, it's <laughs> what an opening that is, because he... He just he's like he pushes her he pushes it behind him, says, get behind me, pulls out yeah, this okay. this snug, this Webley bulldog, and then just pinpoint drops these careering oh, like aim bots. He's just aimbotting them. Yeah. Incredible, incredible. Um, <laughs> open sights, just absolutely having lads. It's, it's amazing. The, the most perfect point shooting. Just <laughs> yeah. them. and that's yeah. where I was locked in after that scene. I know it's really it's early on, opener. but I, I had I'd only ever seen like the man who would be king, and this type of sort of adventure film, and, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, okay, Matt's chosen this one. You know, Matt won't let us down. I know he won't. And I was like, when that lad pulled the web, I was like, this is why a man who is a, a firearms historian in his in his day job chose this movie. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, this is low key a gun movie, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, um, it really is. But yeah, I'm there. I'm there sending Rob WhatsApp texts, just photographs of this of this guy. Billy he literally Williams, watches that out of context all week. <laughs> <laughs> but be look, be on the lookout for this, Chad Robbie, when you watch the film. Yeah. Um. So didn't I mean, you say obviously. like with that guy? He sent me a text of that bloke, but this could be us. But you playing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, oh, that, that is, is it's an incredible opening to the film because it's, it really is. It's um that is setting up the um well t- i'll talk a little bit about uh the actual plot of the movie just to give yeah, some context sure. if you haven't seen it already sure. so uh it's a kidnap movie um eden pedicaris uh and her two kids are kidnapped from a villa in um i think it's like tangiers mm. um sean connery and the the berber tribe attack the town basically ransack it cut down some french soldiers um i think i think 
Billy Williams is possibly the most staunch resistance they met when they did that race. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, so um, the uh, Eden Pericaris, uh, Candice Berg and, and her kids are kidnapped. And this kicks off a massive uh, colonial political um, ruckus. Because yeah, incident. Yeah, they don't want to negotiate, um, but also how are they going to get them back? And the film just develops from there, and you get this lovely mirroring of Roosevelt's position and the Rizuli Connery's position. Um, yeah, it's fab. Just, it's it's how they approach this um, international crisis mm. that they've that's been created. Um, yeah, and it's kind of out of Roosevelt's control almost. <laughs> yeah, it's it sort of does like an A, B, and C plot, but they're all running mm. together. They're all they're it's interlinked. Very, like like yeah. I said, it's exceptionally well written. I think mm, it um, really is. To give a little bit of like historical background to this, so if you did GCSE history in the UK, you'll have probably heard about the Agadir crisis in 1911 as being one of the the bits where World War One is um, sort of catalyzing towards it um where germany and france came to blows right um so in that in that whole area you've got the agadir crisis you've got the moroccan crisis in 1905 there's lots of these colonial crises going on and that's what the film is playing off it's it's actually based on a real incident where um uh, uh actual mr pedicaris mm. yeah Pedicaris, um was kidnapped um, by the character that Connery is based on. So the real character was Raisuni rather than Raisuli. Yeah. Um, and he was known as the, the Sultan of the Mountains. Well, that's that's what the book that was written about him was known as. <laughs> yeah. Popularized him. So, you know, it's that 1920s thing where they, they probably just made up a cool sounding name for him. I don't know what yeah. that was really what he was called. Um, but essentially... Milius read um, an article about Raisuni and the Pedicaris incident and how Roosevelt um, reacted to this at the time and thought that that would make a great movie. And Bit of me, that, yep. <laughs> put, put the script together. Yeah. Um, but of course, from reading the the article, he then found uh, Rosita Forbes' 1924 book, the, the El, Raiz, El Raisuni, the Son of the Mountains. And then from there, the idea grew and it became Eden rather than, uh, I think it was Ian Pedicaris um, and his stepson that was kidnapped initially, originally um, in reality. And then obviously strong female lead, a couple of kids, mm. just makes for a better dynamic. Um, so that, that gives a little bit of context behind the film. So just to round out a little bit more of the production, um, it was edited by uh, Robert L. Wolfe, who was three times Oscar nominated uh, and did lots of episodes of uh, Combat Rob. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, music by uh, Jerry Goldsmith. And I love the score to this movie. It's, it's very good. It's yeah. beautiful. It's in, it's incredible. It's rousing, atmospheric. Um, and it gives it, I think the score gives the film a lot of scale, almost like the Lawrence yeah. of Arabia. It's uh, very score. epic in its nature. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Goldsmith was nominated for no less than 18 Oscars, won one. Um, wow. His, his war movie scores include In Harm's Way, Von Ryan's Express, The Blue Max, Sam Pebbles, Patton, Tora Tora Tora, MacArthur, Inchon, wow. First Blood, Rambo, Rambo First Blood Part 2, Small Soldiers. And the oh, <laughs> amazing. I know. I know. Well, the, the last cast was under eight. Goldsmith's work. Yeah. He's, he's one of the best um score writers you you know it, mm. there ever has been and very good fabulous and i i think the score mm. for this is is amazing it's good um it was shot in 13 weeks um with a lot of the filming being done in spain uh, around seville grenada almira uh madrid uh doubling for tangier and fez and the washington scenes were also filmed in madrid um i think they took over took over um a rather nice hotel that stood mm. in the White House. Um, looks, it all looks decent, doesn't it? It doesn't look it like does, it's and Spain. It, and it stands in really well. Um, mm. The Marines in the scene where they uh, take the... Uh, is, it, is it the... Palace. 
the yeah, the, it's the part. Is it the Sultan of Tangier? That's it. Yeah, Bashir. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Um, that scene was filmed with uh, Spanish troops. They're Spanish. Yep. All of those Marines are, uh, are Spanish. Wow. Um, along with a handful of U.S. Uh, Marine and uh, Navy personnel from um, Cadiz Naval Base. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and they did that whole sequence. Uh, I like that scene. We'll talk about that later. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of nominations, the film um, was uh, nominated for a uh, Oscar for Best Score for Goldsmith. Um, Best Sound Mixing. Uh, it was also nominated uh, for a BAFTA for uh, Score Again from uh, Goldsmith. And the Writers Guild of America um, Award for uh, Best Original Drama. Uh, for Milius, he was nominated but didn't win. Um, which is a shame. I think this film yeah. kind of deserves a little bit more when it a comes to praise. The, yeah. The nominations and awards. But, yeah. mm. So that that rounds out uh that rounds out production. Okay. So on to the retro review. So this week we have our good friend Arthur Thrickle or Thurkle. Um it's Arthur Thurkle, I think. We have our good friend Arthur Thurkle from the Daily Mirror from the 27th of June. 1975, which is the day after it was released in the UK. And I'll just read you a little bit of it now. So he leads with desert shakes are not what they used to be. Once a hot blooded Arab would creep into the tent of a haughty Christian girl and have his rough way with her. But when Sean Connery makes off into the desert with Candice Bergen, uh, Bergen, the nearest he comes to making a pass is to move his pawn during a game of chess. If there is no Valentino stuff to cause aunties to blush in The Wind and the Lion, there are many more bloody deeds of daring do to keep schoolboys cheering. Connery is Rasuli, Sultan of the Berbers and Lord of the Rift. He prays to Allah five times a day, but it struck me that Allah must have been puzzled to hear the sheikh tackling with a Scottish accent. Uh, Rasuli kidnaps American lady Eden Pedecaris uh, and her two children and rides off with them into the mountains. By kidnapping Eden and her family, Rizzuli hopes to put pressure on the Americans and get a better deal for his nomad tribe. Back in the States, tub-thumping President Teddy Roosevelt is running for re-election and uses the kidnapping as a, a vote-catching stunt. He then sends a gunboat and Marines to rescue the family, but the mission fails, falls foul of the French and Germans who want to capture Rizzuli. Brian Keefe plays Roosevelt in a splendidly flamboyant style. The fights are colourfully staged and the locations are beautifully photographed, but Mr Connery's acting, acting talents are hardly extended. I'm afraid that he and his Arabs may have given me the impression of a stranded tourist, uh, touring company of the Desert Song, waiting to get their new show on the road. Did did, uh, did he want a slightly 1940s film where it's a pastiche of... I kind of felt that's what he thought he was getting. Yeah, yeah. I think, I don't know, I think, although... The wall, the role is kind of uh, whitewashed with casting Connery. Mm. Um, I think, but it's not. I, I don't think it's whitewashed as hard as it could be. No, no, he brings yeah. he he brings um, some serious effort to it. I think. Yeah, and I one think... of the things I did read about um, Connery preparing for the role is he he read up on Islam for the film. Right. Okay. Um, which no, I don't I don't know whether every actor would have done. Um, but he obviously oh. there are a number of scenes in the film where they talk about Allah and they mm. talk about um spirituality. Yeah. Uh, and and I think him doing a little bit of reading around that perhaps maybe coloured some of that and gave mm. a little bit more body to it. But yeah, yeah not not a bad review. I mean he succinctly sums up a very complex colonial Yeah. Uh, it's it's not a scather, but I, I feel like maybe he was mm. eyeing up the free bar afterwards. Before, uh, yeah. before the end. Anyway, so we're, we're on to the one-word reviews again with another nice crop of one-word reviews. Thanks, everybody, again. Uh, so Ro- Ross Parrish goes with Theodore. Um, mon- uh, Monkey Rotica goes with Windrific. Uh, Nick uh, Nick Delequip says Unseen, winky face. Ivan Sordo goes with Marines. Uh, Gary K. McCormick, not to be missed, which is all linked with one hyphen, so I thought... That, that's one word right. to me. Yeah. Brian Williams goes with Winchester. Eric Edwards goes with Bully. Um, David Chavaria goes with Marines. Uh, Clive Chapman, unseen again. Um, and finally, we have historical was that says awesome. Yeah. I. This is a film that is possibly 
falls under the radar a little bit. So we had a, a few unseens there. I think it does because I think perhaps the man who would be king eclipses it in the same year. Yeah, possibly. But you know what? I think almost, I think The Wind and the Lion is on TV here in the UK at least, almost more than The Man Who Will Be King. Because Oh yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. the, man, the Man Who Will Be King is, it's it's kind of like, oh, The Man Who Will Be King is on. But mm. we're, we're, with The Wind and the Lion, it's like, oh look, The Wind and the Lion's on. Yeah, I well I had to rent oh, it off of, yeah. um, I couldn't find it on streaming, I had to rent it off of um, Amazon to watch it. Mm. Yeah. Um, which, you know, you can go and watch it on I've Amazon. on ITV. Or... It seems like an ITV4 film for you, from, from yeah. England. We've said that before. You'll know what we mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I like it. It's solid. I'll talk more about it later, final thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe, as we always do, we should move on to the alley tally. It's time for alley tally on Fighting on Film. So as yeah, as Matt said there before before I cut him off, he, it's a gun movie, really, isn't it? Mm. But it's it's, it's it's a gun lover, and we know that much. Um, and there's an attention to detail in this film, which is very, very good. Um, mm. Yeah, there's a number of scenes that make it stand out, and you can tell that he's wanted to get that in. Yes, um, it feels that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like um, even with the was it with the nine nineteen oh nine. I oh, forget the model of the machine gun. You'll know machine gun on the oh, wheel yeah, the, tripod. The 1895. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, that. I'm like, all right, John. <laughs> you didn't have to. So much so that that's mocked up. Is like, it? Oh wow. Yeah, that's why it never fires. He wanted a real firing one. Um, so in that great scene with the marine storm in the palace, mm. there's a, a, a naval machine gun party that jog along with them with a little wheeled. Um, yeah. Little, 1895, often described as a potato digger, um, because the yeah, it's got that yeah. yeah. Um, and he couldn't get a firing one, so what they did was he mocked it up. And if you look at a still or pause it, you can tell it's just slightly off off. in the dimensions, (laughs) right? But he did later get a firing one for uh, Rough Riders, which is ah okay. That was nice. That was that was something he wanted to include clearly. Um, mm. And there's a number yeah. of those scenes, like including the um, the Maxim from his cameo. Yes, yeah. You know, we have all those famous stories of Harry Maxim cutting down trees, trying to sell it to various, um, you know, countries, uh, no- countries and North African sultans and and anyone mm. who would buy. Yes, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. And the, the the late 19th century early 20th century was the golden age of traveling salesmen for for firearms um, yeah being showmen basically yeah and, oh yeah and that's kind of what milius is going for where he asks the son to sit down and try the maxim gun uh which well i might save this for favorite sure because it is yeah great. yeah so you can I'll do talk yeah. about that more later on mm. but we have to again mention billy williams's Webley Bulldog, which he pulls. Yes, and if so he had cool. two of those, he'd have held off the entire day of a ring. <laughs> he would have, yeah. I've got it here six six rounds, six kills. Yeah. It's it's well, it's very good. Yeah, if he hadn't run out of ammunition, he would have been absolutely fine. Mm. It, he, he, there is a, it does that funny film trope of where he like pulls the trigger on an empty chamber and he goes, Oh. Yeah. Oh down. boy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um I it, as I said, it's it's interesting that it's a gun film, but it's interesting that it's a gun film in 1904. Yes. So you get a lot of interesting little things. Like I, I like the that it's an advert for Winchester. It seems like mm-hmm. Winchester product placement. I don't know whether John Millius had an agreement. Or... You had to level it out with that great scene of him complaining about Winchester. <laughs> yeah. So Almost. so um, uh, Roosevelt gets a, a a Winchester for his birthday, and uh, he <laughs> he takes a letter like. Um, what's the word? I can't dictates remember. It. Dictates, yeah, sorry, it. a letter to the Winchester Company, <laughs> saying how he like feels about their rifle and how that the cheek pad isn't properly. Yeah, the fit and finish isn't the good fit and for finish it, is isn't good what enough. Does he say? Must I go to England <laughs> for the a proper fit? I think not. <laughs> and all of his men, all of his cronies, going to go. <laughs> it's that kind of era of politics where. So you know, fun fact, <laughs> fun fact Rob. I spoke to my friend Danny 
uh, Danny Michael, the curator at the Cody Firearms Museum, oh, okay. which yep. holds a, a, one of the best collections of Winchester firearms. They actually have the Winchester Re uh, Repeating Arms Company's factory collection is part of their collection. Wow. Fourth uh, trip for when? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Absolutely. Highly recommend the Cody Firearms Museum. Um, I'm not a shill, but I, I am. For any of our American li English listeners who ever in Cody, <laughs> yeah. tell them Fourth own... sent you. <laughs> So I was talking to Danny about this and, and Danny will come on the show. Um, if you're listening, Danny, um, yeah, please do. You want, I promise. Um, so Danny was saying that they have a very similar letter. Oh, in the archives. Um, and I, 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 when we decided to do this, so I messaged Danny and said, have you ever seen this? And I sent him a screen cap of, of Roosevelt holding up the, the Winchester 1895 as he's like stood behind his desk. Yeah. Um, dictating the letter. And I and I said, there's a really funny scene in the film where he, you know, he basically calls out Winchester, and he's, and Danny said to me, "Hold on, I have a letter that oh my might God. be the inspiration for that." So he sent me a scan of the letter. Wow, it does. It's it's Roosevelt writing to Winchester a few years earlier, so it's around the time of the Spanish um, American War. Sure, and he he complains about the sights on the rifle, the fit of the rifle, um, and he talks about. Um, all of the little changes he wants to the guns. And it's really fascinating because Roosevelt knew what the hell he wanted when it came to guns. Mm, like, yeah. He he was very much of the mindset of, well, I, I want it to be exactly like this. Why can mm. you not do this? Um, and I love the scene in the film because it kind of, you know, replicates that. Yeah, it uh, does. So I don't know how Milius knew about this letter or maybe read about it in a book, perhaps. Um, perhaps, yeah, yeah. It makes sense um, for Milius, you know, he's a big Yeah, but I love that guy. Scene. It's great. And to know that there's, there's a, an actual letter that is kind of similar to that is, yeah. is perfect. Yeah. I've, I've got I, I've got as well the, the, the guns in this. I know you've got the Berbers with their swords and, and rifles and mm. breech loaders. But in this movie, guns to me are like the swashbuckling swords of the 50s. Mm -hmm. They're almost used in that really sort of cavalier way. Like especially with the shotguns at the end, I feel like that could be a saber. It's the way it's treated. It's just, mm. like, it's hard to explain, like verbally. There's some really lovely shots almost along the barrel. Yeah. In that yeah. sequence, guns are treated um, like a tool in this, like yeah. and a way they're not in other movies. Like the way the Iron Red Dawn, like Milius has got a way of shooting firearms that I don't think many yeah. directors that we know of that we've talked about on this show do. Mm, perhaps so. it's hard to sort of it, it, you have to visualize it rather than talk about it but it it, it kind of makes sense to me if it makes sense yeah. to you in I, a way i, I know what yeah you mean. um yeah so those uh the rifles that the bearbers have are mostly mausers there's mm -hmm. a, a few gisales which are um north african and also um, mina region um middle east yeah. north africa it's those long guns with the the curved stocks that's it uh, they look like what the tuscan raiders have in star wars Exactly, that's what inspired uh, the Tuscan yeah. guns, yeah, um, and Mandalorian. Um, of course, yeah. So they have those. Um, the the Germans have this really gorgeous Swedish Mauser, the 1894, which has like an yeah. SMLE's front sight protector on it. <laughs> it does a bit, but it's yeah. a carbine, and they're yeah. so gorgeous. The thing is, when I things. when I watched this movie, like I knew Matt was sitting there in his front room with a pot of tea and a biscuits, just going, "Yep, yeah, that's another great gun there. Yeah, lovely." <laughs> <laughs> just just know it. <laughs> I mean, that is very true. But I'm also going to have to, <laughs> you know, give a shout out to the fact that. It all feels very authentic. Like I'm, yes. I'm I know that the the Swedish 1894 wasn't used by um, German mm -hmm. soldiers in North Africa, but it looks good and the uniform yeah. looks good. It's fine. Yeah, it just, it just doesn't break immersion. That's a good thing. Everything's um, got a lot of thought put into it. There's it doesn't it, does. it. Obviously, it's a big Hollywood production. It's got money behind it, and you feel every penny's been spent in the right places. Yeah. I think that's one of these films biggest strengths. I mean, it's got Krupp seven point five centimeter um, <laughs> yeah. guns at the yeah. end. It's like it's like the Akaba scene from Lawrence of Arabia. It really is. Yeah. It, it's uh, almost like Milius wanted to do a little bit of Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, it's like a bit of Gungadin, a bit of mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence of Arabia, a bit of the Man Who Would Be King, a bit of Rudyard Kipling, tales you read as a schoolboy. Yeah, it's all mixed in there. Um, I've never seen so many Craig Jorgensons in one place. Yes. So, so that's really cool because 
they're anachronistic. They probably wouldn't have had those. Right. They probably would have at that point have had um, um, uh, Winchester Lee, six millimeter Winchester Lees, which is right. what the uh, US Navy and the Marine Corps adopted instead of the crag. I can't wait for the alley tally thread for this <laughs> on Twitter. Oh, I know it needs to be done. But how cool is it to see crag? Yeah. Rifles in the film? Yeah, the the only time I'd ever seen one. Obviously, couldn't get enough Winchester. No, of course not. This in Spain, so yeah, but it's gonna it's like a weird reference for me to make. But the only time I'd ever seen one in any re- de- real detail was when I played Red Dead Redemption Two, because that's one of the bolt oh, action yeah. rifles in it. Mm-hmm. So that's the only like sort of point of call. I was like, oh, I know that gun. That's like it's from Red films, Dead. Uh, like Ninth of April has them because it's a, oh, uh, oh right, okay. movie. Yeah, um, of course. That's that's probably the next. Mm. most on-screen time the crag has had right okay um, but yeah it's it's really cool to see them um appear in the film they could have just given them all um springfield 1903 yeah they could have yeah um and, and been done with it but yeah the, really the, cool. i love sh- the shotguns in this movie are just oh, pure yeah. filth really the way they're the way they're treated guys go flying when they get hit it's, it's, me- it's... it is yeah and yeah you're slam firing them there's a there's a great sequence <laughs> yeah. in that end battle <laughs> Where you're looking almost along the shotgun, and yeah. the guy just slam fires like two rounds into mm-hmm. this. I think it's a German on the roof, and the guy yeah. just falls off the roof. And there's a bit um, where um, Eden gets takes one takes one from the captain who's gonna get who gets hit, and he's gonna get hit again. And she takes it and she holds it in front of her, like almost point shoots it at the guy, and he goes flying. And she she acts a little bit shocked at what she's done because she's mm-hmm. to this point she's talked a good game but she's not actually done anything yeah. in terms of being tough <laughs> yeah exactly the little lad like is an absolute mon- monster in this you know they, I, I, I'll, I'll talk about the characters in a minute because I, I like their arcs um she's quite interesting anyway but then she takes out the other dude and she's amazed at like the power of this shotgun <laughs> it's yeah. so good and i love at the end connery having seen the Amazing might of the Winchester, eighteen ninety seven, <laughs> takes it as his prize at the end. Oh, and God. when he's that, that, and when... that whole little sequence of the slow mo Sean Connery grabbing the shotgun off it's the little so boys, he holds it up while that yeah. amazing Goldsmith yeah. scores playing full power. I went, I went Beautiful. really sort of film theory about that, and I was like, is that is that John Milius trying to make a comment on the the West's influence? in that era of like military technology and colonialism in one like fail swoop of the middle east taking the westerns technology away then using it themselves i'm like is that is that that deep or am i just surmising that given given the the depth of the commentary on colonialism that the rest of the film goes into it's not out the realm of possibility no it just felt that way but it was very like nailed in your brain yeah the winchester 1887s are yeah, like they they are almost pornographic in this film. Yeah, this is what um, this film does to the Craig Jorgensen and the Winchester. What Red Dawn does to the AK. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What it's he just... does to uh, FN <laughs> exactly. FNCs and yeah. call commandos. <laughs> Basically, I just want John Millius to make to do more <laughs> of these types of films. I know, I know. It's a shame he's not done one for a while. Um, um, Homefront was good. That was a good game. Anyway, what else can we mention? Oh, the the German officers C ninety six Mauser. Yeah, that's Mauser cool as well. You, you get of course, a... Sorry, go on. go on. No, 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 it's fine. I'll, I'll say you after the, you. I was just going to say that you get that great little sword fight at the end of the film. It's just, between, I, that's what I, was I thought you were. I knew you were going to say it. So yeah. the four five mind works again. <laughs> I know. Um, but yeah, you get a little, little bit of a, a sword fight, um, and it it's one of those moments where it's two warriors. Like the German officer could shoot Connery, but he decides not to and draws his sword. Um, mm. And it's it's an interesting one because obviously it's they're both warriors, and there's almost a respect at the end of it because Connery spares him mm. um, and salutes him with the sword. In fact, yeah. just like the German officer did at the beginning, it's it's an interesting sequence. Um, it is, but I like that because you get everything. Then you've had a gunfight, you've had a yep. you've had a, a more of a military style. Um, mm-hmm. sequence, you know, a war movie military sequence. Then you get the Berbers charging, so you get that, and that's reminiscent of like all those Bo Guest type of films. Yeah. Um, totally. And and then you get you you get the pomp and circumstance of the Americans marching in and doing what America does, and I think that was Milius's 
little hint at America world policing there, like even before that period, that became a real thing in the 80s and 90s. Um, so there's a lot going on in this film, and I think maybe we should go to, fo- uh, go to favourite scenes and we'll talk about it a bit more. Yeah. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. I've got to admit, I don't have a favourite scene, but I have favourite moments because I, mm. I do, I did like the movie. Um, mm-hmm. I love all of John Huston's scenes as John Hay. Yeah. He's just playing, the, he's Very not a lackey. He, he's playing, the, the guy who, John Hay actually served like for a, a hell of a long time in American politics. And you, John Huston just plays this guy with ease. He doesn't get many lines, but the lines he does get are really good. It's just got this authoritative nature about him. And the fact it's John Houston, I can't see past it when I see the character. I know. I know. But he gets he gets a, one of the funniest lines in the movie when Teddy at the end, Teddy Roosevelt wants to be alone with his bear and he gives the lads this like shit eating grin. <laughs> like he's won the day, he's going to win the election. Happy as Larry. And uh, John Hay Houston brings him down to earth almost with a line by saying, I trust the, like he was a Democrat, like implying the yeah. bear. It's like an opponent. So I, I kind of like that. That's really funny. Uh, but then the real thing that I did enjoy, uh, it's not something we see in 60s, 50s, well, maybe 60s movies, but you do see them in a few, but it's not the general thing that you see. So the character of Eden um, uh, by Bergen, she, she just bucks the trend of that damsel in distress that you're expecting at the oh, start. Totally, yeah. yeah. And I love it. Um from the line from from the get-go she's laughing at Razuli, not taking him seriously as if he's some like you know third rate pantomime villain and that's how the america might or 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 the west might see this person and they might not take them seriously and then she grows to respect him but also she's telling him throughout the film look you can't win the west is going to come and get you you can't win you can't possibly do this but it's her lines like i'm no coward um, if you or these men should lay a hand on me, I will try with all my strength to kill you. Yeah. And I love it. And it's just the, the way her lines are written, the way she speaks, she's that she feels like a person in that time period who's grew up oh, totally. yeah. in that class of people. Very headstrong woman. I really enjoyed her character. Um, every time she wasn't on screen, I was like, come on, I want to see her. She reminded me of Princess Leia. That's how I can say. Yeah, it's a very, very strong, well-written female character. Mm. Um, she could have played Leia, I think, the actress. Yeah, yeah, possibly so. Yeah, I well, if you consider, you know, there's, there's a scene at the end of the film where she she fools the the Marine Corps captain into letting his guard down, steals his mm. pistol, takes all the Marines' guns, and basically says, "You aren't going to help the Rizuli because the Rizuli has been captured by the Germans." And yes, it, the, the essentially he takes Eden and the kids to be handed over to get his um, ransom mm. and it's a double cross um yeah uh and the marines aren't going to save save him because why would they they just see him as um the, they're like turning on their agreement the kidnapper keeping him safe anyway yeah um but they also they're also spoiling for a fight with the germans apparently <laughs> which yeah. isn't really grounded in anything in the film but they're, no. they're gung-ho enough about it that you're just like okay whatever <laughs> but he's um, the most that captain is the most ruthless like He's almost like a pirate himself, the way they present him. Like, he's so... Like he's could be played by Errol Flynn. He's that type yeah. of character. Oh, I know. He's, he's very... Um, he's very interesting in the way... War happy. I'll, I'll <laughs> talk about that scene in a minute where they... Um, a world war. Oh, no. I, 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 I on. <laughs> Yeah, I was yeah. thinking of a different scene. It's just the non- nonchalant nature of war- marching up to the front of that palace and just shooting those guards who <laughs> haven't even prov- provoked you. It's just such I'm like, oh, oh I, what? I know, I know. There's a succession <laughs> of those sequences. But yeah. just to get back to the one I was going to Sorry. talk about, about Petty Karras, is that she takes the shotgun off him and she goes, and he goes, do you know how to use that? And, and she says something like, I've shot quail in... <laughs> That's and, it. It's a great line. And, um, uh, pheasant in in Scotland. Yeah, I, I know how to use this. It's um, great. And she's like, "Me and my kids are going to go and rescue the Rizuli now." Um, <laughs> yeah. So he, he kind of has to be like, "No, okay, we'll throw him with you. We'll help." <laughs> That's great. It, yeah, it's good. It's great. Um, and I also I, I totally to... agree. Yeah, he really, you know, quite rounded out and robust as a character. Mm, she very much is, and even the bits when she's trying to escape, 
and they get so far but it's so forthright she's like right we're gonna make good our escape can you believe yeah. it yeah she's gonna yeah. yeah you know and with her little sort of kid her little son who's turned from this like mild-mannered schoolboy into a bloodthirsty berbo in like 20 minutes it's great yeah you uh, know. he's he's knocked out the um guard with a plant pot <laughs> but he's, hit him he's over the head twice rifle. yeah <laughs> major um, cranial injuries that lad's caused <laughs> And in the in the fight against the pirates at the end, he, I think he kills he kills two of them. <laughs> he does, um, yeah. And you just stood there like, what is going on? <laughs> he bucks the uh, he bucks the trend for terrible child acting in war movies. He bucks he the trend. Say, Milius is very clever with that. In I think I talked I think we talked about this at the time, and I was like, the the way he's approached this is he gives them very few lines. So yes. They don't. Yes. Be irritating. Him and um, I, I'd pay to see him and Emil in a fight. <laughs> cage match a meal a meal wouldn't last five seconds he'd be toast <laughs> wouldn't last five seconds um yeah i i i agree that it's hard to pick a favorite scene there's a lot mm. of really great ones and just it, to, it just to go of... back to houston and keith the only reason why houston doesn't completely steal those scenes is because of how good keith is as we oh yeah yeah i just was like this guy's teddy roosevelt the minute I saw him, I was like, is that makeup? No, he just looks like him. <laughs> in the, I, love, the I love all of the Roosevelt scenes. He's so great. You meet him and he's he's like boxing some random dude <laughs> in the White House <laughs> gardens. And then the next time it's you see him, he's on a shooting him. range. Yeah. Yeah, with um <laughs> with a, a martini Henry. And then Sporterized he, he, version. Yeah, he's yeah. got like a little shoots and target martini Henry. Um and then he pulls out a um I think it's a Springfield or um, no, it's not. It's a, it's another Mauser. It's a yeah, it's another Mauser. Yeah, I think it's a Spanish, Spanish Mauser. And he's um, and his daughter says, "Why are you closing your uh, your eye, father?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm blind in that eye. <laughs> I got boxing. blinded in the boxing." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even so much like at the end, when he's reading the note. He has to put his hand up to his eye. It just feels like the most Teddy Roosevelt thing he could <laughs> ever say. It's like a double R bastard, but it just so happens yeah. to be the prime, the president. It's great. And he's goofy as well. But <laughs> he is he goofy just, about it. Yeah, he feels like a nice dude, mm. but also very much um, double hard bastard, as you say. Yeah, I'm not going to fuck about. Yeah, I, I I love all those scenes with Houston and um, and Keith because you're immediately immersed in it. You know it's John Houston, but mm. he's he's so likable, and Keith is so good as Roosevelt that it just takes you straight into the sequence. Yes, it does. It feels yeah. it feels very I don't I don't think there's enough of those scenes. I would have liked more Roosevelt. No, but I think but see I the film anyway. Yeah, it's a lot it doesn't feel long. God but the admit. focus isn't really Roosevelt. No, it, it kind of it it's hard to say, it like sweeps through it. Mm. They, they, they never feel like right, that bit's ended now or on this bit. It all feels like it is going on at the same time. Um and I think if you'd have leaned more into the diplomacy part of it, I think you might have lost the audiences in a bit it just enough it mirrors you know the response of the berbers to the response of the west and the, you get the, the little subplot of is the woman going to be okay and her kids and then when you learn that they're not they're going to be fine you know it's, they're not really they're just a pawn you know when you learn that the movie opens up and becomes more about the way the west and the way that the Berber sort of treat each other and, and how that, that's in there. So it becomes a little bit more than you're expecting it to become. Um, but I don't know what you mean about not having a favourite scene, perhaps. I do know it. But isn't is not your favourite scene the Maxim bit? I think it is, just just for the small nod. And I love that whole sequence where he's at the Sultan's Palace and he it's the an American diplomat is taking two tigers or lions, one of the <laughs> yeah. lions, um, as a as a gift to get to talk to the the Sultan to um Influence the Sultan to put pressure onto um, onto Razuli and to pay, mm-hmm. pay him off essentially. Yeah. So he takes these two lines and he's talking to um, a servant that leads him through the palace, and you get this really uh, nice shot of him walking through the corridors, and then just off in the distance, in another room, a few a few uh, meters away, there's an actual train inside the palace. Like he's been gifted a train by some yeah. European country. Yeah. And there's no way that he can, you know, run this anywhere. So he's just put in his palace. Um, you walk. He opens the shot opens up into that courtyard, and there's a load of European diplomats and courtesans playing polo on bicycles. 
and the Sultan's like cackling like a hyena, um, (laughs) just having the best possible time. And then Milius playing a a German, I I guess, salesman. Yeah. um, Says, would the Sultan like to try the uh, test the Maxim gun? Um, And he, he, the Sultan goes to sit behind it and two attendants run and form a human (laughs) chair for him. Yeah. And I just I just love the way that Milius is is ramping this surrealness. Mm. Yeah. He, the Sultan sits behind the Maxim gun, fires off half a belt, it jams. Um and he says it's broken. And Milius turns to him and says, Is his excellency displeased? That's his talking, yeah. that's his speaking line. It is, yeah. Um, and then the diplomat and the Sultan get onto a human drawn carriage of state. <laughs> It's great. And talk about the Rizuli. It's yeah. just a, it's an incredibly surreal sequence, mm. but it gives this um it puts that colonial context yeah. into the film. Yeah. And creates this um for the audience, it creates this um understanding of this is a very different culture uh, mm. in North Africa. And it's these people hold sway, but they're holding sway over Europeans, almost at the Europeans' um, behest. Yeah, they're going to get what they want. They're going to get what they want out of this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's very interesting. The whole film does this really interesting look at colonialism. And I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's a bit where um, the the Marine Corps captain and the Admiral uh, visit the legation, Mm. I think Tangiers or Fairs, one or the other. to meet the, the ambassador who's been trying to negotiate the release of, of Peter Karras and her children. And um, he's all for, you know, uh, being a diplomat. And then the Admiral's like, well, why don't we just, you know, take over the Basha's par- palace? Yeah, no, um, right. yeah. Why don't we, why don't we just um, take control? Uh, we've got three gunboats in the Harbor. Yep. We've got two, we got two reinforced rifle companies and Marines. Mm. Um, and he goes, well, it'll, it'll start a war, a world war. Yeah, such so on the nose. That's that's the most <laughs> annoying dialogue in there. Like, <laughs> but I think it's supposed to be because of the way it's yeah. shot as well. Because they, well, it's like, well, we can do it from down, but they're up. You can see their chins, like it's, it's, it's kind a of looks up, and there's a map yeah. on the wall, and yeah. they're all stood there thinking, like in a in a almost comical looking up. Yeah. Like, into the, into just the middle distance. It's, it's almost like, Milius going foreshadowing to the Great War. Yeah. Exactly, and they all end up in a chorus of a world war. A world war. That'd be a hell of a way to go out. I know, right? <laughs> it's like geez. Um, so w- within this second, this five minute scene, the the uh, the consul, the American consul, has been swayed into this course of action by mm. the military, um, which I think is another interesting commentary point. Uh, and you you get this great sequence of where they're attacking um, the palace, and they mm. they start off at the harbor, and there's this drumbeat from the the navy band that accompanies the it's great. advance, and they double, they basically double through the the port, don't they? Yeah, um, you you get that that's extended, that feels too it feels too extended not to be making a point. Yes. Oh, it's totally making a, yeah. making a point. I think I I definitely agree. You know, it starts s- slow and they're moving the locals out of the way gently. Then they, yeah. you know, they're, they're running at the double and there's people getting pushed into shops and <laughs> yeah, they don't over, care. Yeah. People getting hit with rifle butts by the, you know, by the time they get to the, um, the palace, um, the band is like way behind. They've left. <laughs> yeah. The band aren't there anymore. Yeah. Um, the band arrives just as the battle's over, actually. Um, <laughs> and oh you know, they line up these two reinforced rifle companies in front of the palace, and the guards are kind of like, "What's what's going on?" <laughs> the lads are like, ah. One of them kind of like brings up the, his rifle, <laughs> yeah. Not, and they're all like looking at one another. And then Captain Jerome just gives the order to fire. He goes, "Hostiles to the left." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They will light. A hundred crags just drop this tiny yeah. palace guard, and then there's <laughs> and then... a bayonet fight. They bayonet charge like a light of dead bodies. It's amazing, like, and that that's for me is like obviously you're poking fun at the way that it's just spiraled really quickly, and it didn't have to. Like it's 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 very interesting. Um, and I think it's maybe 
I don't know if Milius intended it, but it's showing that whole sort of gumbo diplomacy thing and, and you know, sort of politics by rifle, um, mm-hmm. showing that up for all it's worth. It's very good. Totally. Totally. Mm. And yet it's still a very enjoyable swashbuckler at its heart. It is. And that yeah. ending is, is uh, a really good way of rounding out the film. It, it just, mm. It's an exciting end to the movie. You've got um, a, a flavor of Lawrence of Arabia with the the Berbers charging, um, fighting the Germans. Um, yep, yep. Obviously not Turks in this film, but no, the, the Germans are wearing um, uniforms similar to the Turks. I would say a little bit. They've got like their colonial the sort of colonial. tropical uniform. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's definitely flavors of it. Um, it's so funny. Final thoughts, it sounds like, doesn't it? Really, we're getting into it. We're getting there, aren't we? I think Mm. there's a lot of really interesting commentary. Um, There's a great line from from Connery where he says, the Europeans have guns that fire many times promiscuously. Um, Yeah. Or was it promiscuously? Yeah, yeah, promiscuously. Yeah, 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 he does. That's Mm. it. Um, And I think that's a really interesting line because there's there's this conversation with Pedicaris where he asks her, what kind of rifle does um, does Roosevelt shoot? And she's... Mm. Like a Winchester, um, yeah, Winchester. Yeah. I have no knowledge of this weapon. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about European technology mm. and uh, and that kind of thing, which I think is really underlines our. It's spot on. Commentary. It really does. I mean, for me, like final thoughts this week. It's a solid film. I, I enjoyed it. it. It's it. It doesn't breeze by. I must admit, it's a. It's not a long two hours, but you know it's a long film. You feel it. Yeah. But then you feel it is all leading somewhere. It's not. Mm-hmm. I was worried that I would find it too long in places, or I'd lose so interest. I, I, before Rob watched it, I was like, "Is this is this going to be one of those occasions where Robbie watches the film in multiple setting cities?" No, I did it in one sitting. I did it in one sitting. It's, it's just the pace isn't there. But I think the pace is. There. No, it is. It is good. It is well paced, and and the the story and plot of everyone will they won't they will they send troops in is enough. Um, as I said, as I said, I still think from the favorite scenes, it's a film of good moments. It's not a film of great scenes, but it's a film of good performances. And I think if you like any of the main trio of actors, I think you'll enjoy this. If you want to see one of the better representations of an American president on screen, it's definitely for you. If you're a Sean Connery fan and you haven't seen him in many things other than Bond, and you know as well as The Hill and The Offense by Sidney Lumet, I would recommend this for Sean Connery fans if you've not seen him. Because you won't seem like this again, um, playing an absolute, playing a villain with a bit more nuance than you get usually. Yeah, and he's charismatic yeah. as ever. Oh, without doubt. Yeah, you end, you root for him after the first half hour. Totally, you're like, totally. yeah, you, you're vibing with the Rizzoli all the way to the end. Um, <laughs> it's not brand new sentence time, everyone. <laughs> um, it just reminded me of an Errol Flynn swashbuckler, a hornblower type movie. Um, if you like the um, the man who would be king, you'll love this. And Matt said when we when we sat down to devise this episode, it's a Sunday afternoon film. Mm. I think that's that's my crux of it. Yeah, definitely. It's a really solid historical epic. Yeah. And okay, Connery perhaps isn't the best casting for this, um, but he brings a lot to the role, and he's charismatic. As I said, he's exactly yeah, um, and he brings a lot of pathos and a lot of uh, nuance, subtle nuance to it mm. um, which i think is what this film needs and i think the film is more than just one of those um historical epics where it's like okay yeah this is happening that's happening over mm. there's commentary within the way that millis has written it and there is there's a lot of there's a lot of uh as you mentioned earlier Rob, there's a lot of like homage to um those early riff movies there's homage to lawrence of arabia there's there's lots of things Milius is pulling from to to, mm. to create this adventure, and I think it altogether it comes out amazingly. And I think it's only his second film. Yeah, second credit as director. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to to do films of a director that you're not you're, you're familiar with the one film. And I think I think most people when you mention John Milius, they're either going to say, "Oh, yeah, he co-wrote Apocalypse Now" or "Red Dawn." Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're not going to say "Farewell with the King." They're not going to say. Oh, what's that other one he did? Um, doesn't matter, but they're not going to say the thing you think you're not going to say this. So I think it 
as an early Milius movie, I think it's interesting to look at it from his the way his career goes. Um, you know, one of the greatest sort of eighties reflectionist movies that, that, uh, of the time period. I mean, this might be one of the greatest films that have a colonial commentary. Um, there aren't many. <laughs> a, a, a big Hollywood picture. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. In, in this time period, to do something like this is interesting. Mm. Definitely mm. interesting. Yeah, and that whole thing of how America treats a country maybe would perceive as smaller in 1975 and the fall of Saigon. There's all of that in there too. Mm, mm, um, there's context to it. So there's a lot of interesting context around the time period. It's worth it. It's a solid watch if you can find it. And another, another solid film. I agree. It's, it, I was excited to cover this because I knew that um, it'd be a great one to talk about because of the, you know, the various nuances. And I thought you would enjoy it. Although mm. I, I did wonder whether you thought the pacing might be a little too slow, but no, I thought I think, it, it rattled, I think as we've said, it, it, it runs along quite nicely. Um, mm. it's, if it's on TV, if it's on the streaming services, you definitely take a look at it. Yeah, it's worth the two ninety nine that I rented it for. Yeah. yeah on on it Amazon, it's worth it. Yeah, so that was uh, The Wind and Lion. Next week, we have the Patreon pick, which is 1957's Ill Met by Moonlight, the Dirk Bogard film that I'm interested in watching because um, yeah. I've not seen it the whole way through before. Uh, and yeah, and we'll catch you next week. I think Matt's in Las Vegas, isn't he? Next week. I, well, right now, this week, as, as when, of, when this goes, yeah, out, as of I'm, recording, I'm, uh, in Sh- yes. yeah, in uh, Las Vegas at Shot Show. Don't whittle away all of the uh, the the fof funds when you're there. I'm a terrible gambler. <laughs> I I never gamble because I don't know what the hell's going on. So I mean, it's a long shot. But if any listeners are at Shot Show, look out for Matt. Yeah, I'll be I'll be the one furiously writing in a notebook. <laughs> you will be, yeah. Yeah, covering all of the shot show. So we're interested to hear all about that when you come back um, for Ill Met by Moonlight. And as always, I please... Wait for that one. It's going to be fun. So as always, please leave us a review or a like or a subscription on whatever podcast app you're listening on. And if you want to catch up with the show, you can start by uh, going to fightingonfilm.com and you can find our entire back catalogue from there. And as always, thanks for listening. And we'll catch you again next week. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Viva Las Vegas! Matt's going to Las Vegas!